Welcome to Sherlock Mondays. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we're going on a biblio venture through the stories of Sherlock Holmes. This is episode 11, The Adventure of the Speckled Band, and joining me as co-host is Monica Schmidt. Hello, Monica. Hey, Ed. How are you doing tonight? I am great. I could, of course, call you Monica. I could call you Miss Stoner. We will get into all that coming up soon. Um, that will be great. I am looking forward to hearing about your personal connections with this story um, because we do those kinds of things on this show. We also, on Sherlock Mondays, deduce, decipher, dissect Arthur Conan Doyle's stories about the world's first consulting detective Sherlock Holmes and his able assistant, Dr. John Watson, in a kind of conversational annotation. If you are watching live right now, I ask you to please like and subscribe to these videos uh, and have fun in the live chat. That's one of the joys about uh, watching the show live as you get to interact with everyone in the live chat. If you're watching the recording, that's okay. Uh, thanks for watching anyway, and please like and subscribe. Um, Sherlock Mondays is also an audio podcast, and thank you to all of our podcast listeners out there. I would ask you all to please consider making making a donation to the Rosenback. Uh, thank you if you have already donated or joined as a member of the Rosenback since the show began. That's really how we get to do these shows free for everyone because of your support for the Rosenback. So if you have not already donated or become a member or would like to donate some more, I invite you to do so, and thank you. Um, before we get to all of your snaky links here, I want to introduce the uh, cocktail. What am I drinking today? Ooh. And you're drinking it too. I know, it's it's a rarity. I'm home, so this is my home office, and uh, my favorite mixologist, I also known as my husband, Bill, has decided to uh, actually make the cocktail and I've been enjoying a little bit of it so far as you can see. <laughs> That's lovely. You see, I've got a little snake coming out of mine. Little... I've got the bell pole also. Speckled snake. Yes. Oh man, I love it. Yeah, I've got the bell pole coming out of mine. <laughs> Every episode features a Sherlock tale designed by one of our co-hosts, Mary El Caro, who will be on next week. Um, and this, this drink, the bell pole, is uh, it's a variation on a bourbon milk milk punch it's bourbon and dark rum milk uh there's also simple syrup vanilla cardamom in it uh i put a little uh star of uh anise on it and it's what is it is it anise or anise i never it's, i think it's heard, anise i've heard both yeah uh, I've, I've, I've heard or maybe both, i just but... said both you know well, um, well i think uh i i think anise usually is like the thing that makes 18 or like yo know, uh children kind of giggle a little bit so mm -hmm. i think thus and these <laughs> <laughs> well this is good um uh it's you know and, and and you shake it up in the shaker and then it gets this nice little foamy top on it mm -hmm. um i like uh this is just this is one of those too easy to drink ones i don't know i say that every week i think yeah, but uh, the, this one this one does go down very quickly and very smoothly. So um, um, I've got plenty. I'm, of I'm having one of these, and then I'm having having Bill switch me over to something else. I've prepped plenty, so I just need oh. to shake it up, and I'm ready to go. Oh man, uh, yeah, I I can only handle one of these. I think. <laughs> uh, you can find the recipe in the YouTube description for this episode, and I also send out the recipe via email every week for those who are registered. For the show, you can register at the Sherlock Mondays homepage on Rosenbeck.org. Monica, when when we set up this with with you and the other co-hosts Anastasia mm -hmm. and Mary and Curtis, we 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 all talked about like, all right, who's who wants to who wants to do what stories instead of just having a rotation? Mm -hmm. Does anybody want stories? And and you wanted the sign of four to beginning because the whole cocaine Drugs. addiction, yes. you had to do that. And of course you were like, I got to do speckled band. Absolutely. Because you have some great links with characters, the story and oh, tell us, tell us, tell us why this is, this is a, a personal story for you. Well, I mean, there, there's actually kind of two layers to this. The reason why I volunteered for a scandal in Bohemia is because in the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, I have the investiture, the Church of St. Monica, which yes. is, of course, where uh, Godfrey Norton and Irene Adler got married. Um, so 
that's my Ash investiture. Um, in the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, you get to choose your own moniker, so to speak. But in the Baker Street Irregulars, when they make you a member, you are assigned a moniker. You are given a moniker. Um, and my investiture name is Julia Stoner. And so I have, we'll just say, very strong emotional ties to this, um, you know, to the story as well as to uh, um, our favorite deceased sister. <laughs> And also lots of snakes, um, snakes, snake earrings, snake necklace, yes. snake rings. Yeah, I've got a cobra, you know, uh, snake necklace, uh, more snake necklaces. Um, I mean, you know, I have friends that, uh, you know, have um, sent me snake earrings, um, another snake earring. Um, I mean, snake slap bracelet, even. Uh, I mean, it's it, the accessory. Cufflinks? Yeah, you have your cufflinks on. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and um, when I became a member of the Speckled Band of Boston, um, I was um, the kind of gift uh, uh, for membership is either like a brooch or cufflinks. And I wear, you know, I wear French cuff shirts. So cufflinks it is. So I get to I get to be very decked out in snakes today. The, and speckled, that's the, jacket. <laughs> the speckled Band of Boston is one of the uh, Scion Societies of the Baker Street Irregulars. And you... Uh, uh, became well you're more than a member for, well i uh, well i became i became a member earlier this year officially yeah um so the the long story short um just because this is a a, a very lengthy tale but uh, the speckled band of boston is one of the sherlock Holmes societies that was founded um in the early days it was actually founded in 1940 just um like the bsi was founded in in 1934 Speckle Band of Boston, 1940. So it's one of the oldest societies in America. But from moment number one, it was stag. And so my gender, you know, kept me out um, and kept all women out, you know, for decades. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to get into the whole history of, of, of like how change happened. But in 2017, um, there was a unanimous vote uh, by the members of the Speckle Band to go co-ed. And, um, you know, uh, it was announced actually on I Hear of Sherlock, uh, which is the premier podcast. Um, actually, I've got the I Hear of, there we go, I Hear of Sherlock mug right there. Um, but um, it was announced on the I Hear of Sherlock Facebook page. And there were largely two reactions to, um, you know, to the announcement. There was, yay, guys, good job. And the, um, it took you long enough, guys, what the heck? And, um, you know, um, there were some people who were unaware of kind of some of the social dynamics and it, within the context of the community that uh, oftentimes change is implemented after uh, the death of someone who is very important within, um, you know, that particular organization or the community and change thus then can happen. And that's kind of what happened here is that um, a, a very uh, beloved member of the Speckled Band of Boston, uh, Dr. John Constable passed away in 2016. He started attending in 1944, I hear. Um, and so like he had ties to the original members. And so he, they didn't want to change the charter of the organization until after Dr. Constable was gone. Um, and thus they did. Um, and then flash forward to 2019. In uh, January of 2019, I became a member of the BSI and was thus uh, dubbed Julia Stoner. And a very wonderful and distinguished member of the Speckled Band of Boston, a gentleman by the name of Richard Olkin, uh, came up to me on um, the, the day after and actually took off his Speckled Band bow tie and handed it to me and says, Julia Stoner must have a snake. And, um, you know, he and I, you know, um, he made arrangements for me to attend their dinner in 2019. And um, in order to become a member, you need to attend uh, two meetings and submit a scholarly essay to the reading committee. And then if you're lucky, this, the reading committee selects your essay for a competition after dinner. And then, um, you know, uh, we'll just we'll get into that in a moment. But um, I attended my first meeting in um, 2019 and COVID happened and they didn't hold, hold another dinner until 2023. Mm -hmm. 
And so I was able to, uh, with a delightful gap in the middle, um, become a member in 2019 because I submitted a paper. I've submitted an essay in actually February of 2020. And um, I was lucky enough that I was able to do a presentation um, after dinner in um, 29 or in 2023. So this past May. And um, what happens is the papers are in kind of are kind of in competition. And there is a trophy, so to speak, um, the Sherlock Holmes Memorial Bowl that is given to the uh, person that whose paper is gauged to be the uh, uh, the, the best of the evening. And um, I am, um, I'll just say there, there have only been two opportunities for women to do presentations in 20, uh, 2019. So 2018 was the first year that women were allowed. 2019 was the first year that women were allowed and also able to do presentations. And then 2023 would mark the third year. So the second year for the presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, Sonia Featherston um, of uh, Washington uh, won the, uh, the Sherlock Holmes Memorial Bowl. So she won the competition the, um, in 2019. And I am lucky to be the uh, possessor of the Sherlock Holmes Memorial Bowl for 2023. Uh, this is basically the Stanley Cup of Sherlock yeah. That's the top. That's like the top of the Stanley Cup there, but exactly, it's 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 um silver. I mean, it's beautiful silver. I have to polish it um and keep you know keep the tarnish off, um. But um, it is beautifully etched. It's kind of hard to see with the um with the glare, mm -hmm. but it's beautifully etched with a snake around it. You know, the Sherlock Holmes Memorial Bowl, um, you know, in the speckled band of Boston, and so you can kind of see that. But um, you know, um, it's much like the Stanley Cup, people who win it, um, you know, have to return it the next year. Um, and so it goes off to the next person. So I'm in possession of it for a year. Um, I have eaten popcorn out of it. I've drank yeah. champagne out of it. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, the, the typical things that one does with the Stanley Cup, I've, I've, I've <laughs> it all, you know, smuggled with it. Um, you know, um, it's 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 a it's a beautiful tradition, and um, I am extraordinarily honored, you know, to have been able to not only attend but uh, to be in a position to be in competition to win um, that uh, uh, you know that that beautiful trophy and kind of have my uh, we'll just say kind of my my name associated with the winners of the competition from here until eternity. So yeah. it's pretty cool. Uh, um, yeah, I'm. I'm. I, I have to admit the, uh, the the gentlemen and now ladies and gentlemen of the band, you know, have been very good to to me. Um, and you know, I even though I live in Iowa, um, I one of my favorite things to do is to um, you know fly to the East Coast, um, you know, and uh, hang out with the crew in Boston as well as the wonderful crew in Philadelphia. So, traveling is part of my you know, what makes Sherlocking fun for me you go to so many things you know mm -hmm. in so many places I'm lucky um you know um I've always had the philosophy that if uh, somebody um takes the time to extend an invitation that uh I want to try to honor that invitation sometimes it's just impossible but uh being a therapist in private practice means that I'm my own boss and I've got a really awesome boss <laughs> and she's very generous with allotting time off um and so it's um it's it's nice that I'm able to adjust my schedule um uh, around my therapy schedule with my clients uh to be able to attend a lot of events Great. so it's, it's pretty cool and we, oh go ahead because you're because you're home today in your home office, we get to see your, you know, Sherlockian books and things. Oh, yeah. Point out that I hose cup. Point out one thing and tell us about it. Oh, gosh. Um, I know one. I this this is this is going to this is going to be hard. Be book, um, be okay, if we're doing if we're doing one thing. There you go. All right. Um, an emerald tie pin. So this is a gift from a certain gracious lady. Um, and if you've ever read the story, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, but um, there is a story in which Sherlock Holmes is given by a certain gracious lady, i.e. Queen Victoria, a um, an emerald tie pin as a as kind of as a gift. Um, you know, he was um, offered a knighthood. He declined. But, uh, you know, he gets an emerald tie pin uh, from Queen Victoria, um, a wonderful Sherlockian um, who shall go nameless because I don't want her being bombarded with things. But uh, 
Um, <laughs> she is a person. She is a person who gives out gifts, and uh, she is um, a world class jewelry designer and metal worker. Wow. And um, every single emerald tie pin that she gives out is unique. And so she gives these out as uh, thank you gifts to, you know, or gifts to friends. Um, there's kind of a, a little bit of a tradition or custom in, in the community about that. And uh, actually, uh, the gift that I give out um, is actually the gift of glassware to BSI members, um, you know, personalized. Um, mine just happens to be Julia Stoner with the snake. Um, I'm drinking out of uh, my Julia Stoner rocks glass, but you can't see it because the white on the white doesn't quite yeah. work. But, um, you know, there's there's some cool stuff here, um, you yeah, know, but I mean, it's it's a lot of, um, you know, gift giving and uh, actually uh, yeah. trinkets and other cool things. And um, just because I'm here, I'm going to do one more because it is. Oh, I want to see it. Yeah, related. Yeah, this yeah. is a, a beautiful, um, you know, uh, we'll just say whiskey decanter that was given to me by my friend Jacqueline. And um, of course, it's Julia Stoner's um, anti snake venom which I absolutely love. And on the back end is, um, you know, distilled by the Church of St. Monica. Um, and of course, so it's my BSI and my Ash Investitures. It is an extraordinarily thoughtful gift. And, uh, you know, I, I, Sherlockians are the most generous of people. That is a lovely glass can, decanter. Um, oh, yes. Some, some, uh, uh, one of the viewers has wondered if, if there's a way to read your winning essay. Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, the the answer is yes. Um, give me one second here. I've got to find it. Um, so well, we're not. You're not going to read it right now. Oh, no, 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 no. But uh, <laughs> there, it, it was it was published in a book, and now I just got to okay. find the book. Um, here we go. Um, my award winning essay actually is um, was published in um by ballinger books there's um you know, i've had books. it and i've read it yeah yes the three pipe um you know christmas and so i'm dealing with um henry and again, baker it's, it's bellinger books and the yep. book is called oh. a three pipe a three pipe christmas um and it's edited by dan andriaco who is the current editor of the baker street journal yeah. um you know so this was actually from before he was the current editor uh, but um, the essay was published in, in there. This is basically, um, in this particular book, it's The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle, um, a reprint of The Unique Hamlet by Vincent Sterrett, yeah. uh, The Adventure of the Unique Dickinsons by August Derleth, who was the, um, he was actually the publisher of H.P. Lovecraft, mm -hmm. um, Yay Sauk City, Wisconsin. Um, and um, also, you know, a couple of essays in there, including mine, uh, because it deals with uh, the Blue Carbuncle and Christmas time. And uh, we'll just say this is that, uh, to be perfectly honest, as a drug and alcohol counselor, my essay is a little bit of a downer. Um, and it would be a spoiler for the Blue Carbuncle discussion we're going to have in a couple of weeks. So I won't talk about my essay. <laughs> yeah. Because this, in, yeah. in publication order, we should be hitting the Blue Carbuncle mm -hmm. now. Yes, um, it was we after la the last episode was Man with a Twisted Lip, and then the Blue Carbuncle came out. But we are going to hold off because on these live, you know, streams mm -hmm. of the of the shows, the we're going to wait until right before the the Blue right before Christmas. So it'll be yes. December eighteenth if you're watching live. Um, yeah, we're going to save the Blue Carbuncle for then. So we're we're going a little bit out of order yeah. with the Speckled Band, and but we'll get to the Blue Carbuncle in it's, just a few weeks. Yeah, there's there's good reason. You know, um, Blue Carbuncle is the only Sherlock Holmes story that is kind of Christmassy time. Oh, yeah, it starts time. off. It's the second day after Christmas, and then you know, exactly. the about um, a Christmas dinner gone awry. And, uh, yeah, and and my <laughs> my my poor husband has been been subjected to the Jeremy Brett version of of the oh, Blue Carbuncle love it. for love twenty two. This this will be let's see, Ken has math. This will be the twenty second year running that either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day that my poor husband has been subjected to the Blue Carbuncle. Yeah. I'm a terrible wife. <laughs> well, for the new Sherlockians in our audience, it's like now there's another, now it's, it, it can be Christmas Carol every year and Blue Carbuncle because exactly. there are certain things you always need to do. For me, I also also have to do Child's Christmas in Wales by Dylan Ooh, Thomas, but nice. But we're not like we, a couple weeks. I'm going to stop yeah, talking a couple about weeks. Christmas. We'll, we'll talk about Christmas. You can true. tell by my long white beard that I'm a very happy Christmas <laughs> celebrator. So um, fair, fair enough, Ed. Fair enough. All righty. 
On with our story for today. We have shared a PD. Oh, I'm, I'm, and thank you, Monica, for sharing all that stuff. I love that you have all these ties and all this yeah, you know, snake, echo band, swag, yeah, all this all stuff. It's just snakes. awesome. Well, everyone, we've shared we've shared a PDF of a facsimile of the adventure of the speckled band as it was originally published in the February 1892 issue of the Strand Magazine. You can download that on the Rosenbach's Sherlock Mondays page. And here we go, February 1892. This story is has always been one of the most popular stories in the canon. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody seems to love it. Conan Doyle himself said it included in his 12, you know, best yeah, stories. His favorites. Um, there's a, re a review of the first collection of stories when after the after a year in the Strand, they published uh, in book form, The Adventures of Sherlock mm -hmm. Holmes. And in a, 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 a journal called the Saturday Review, mm -hmm. uh, in that review, they, it says each story has its own peculiar interest and several are extremely dramatic. The speckled mm -hmm. band is decidedly the most thrilling. <laughs> it has the creepiest of unexpected denouements, which takes yep. the breath away and compels the reader to pause, beginning a fresh story. So um, Doyle liked it so much, this story. And of course, because he's an, a writer of the 19th century, he has to become a playwright. Um, he actually did. He actually did make, wrote, wrote several plays and some of them were actually mm -hmm. successful in, in their time. But he had booked the, uh, and this is in, um, uh, it's the early 20th century. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember the year he had booked the Adelphia theater in London mm -hmm. uh, for six months to do a play. And the play yeah. he did, I can't remember which, what it was, didn't do that well. So he's got to fill up. <laughs> he can't just run a play for six months if nobody's going to it. So he's got to, he's got to yeah. fill up the lease with other plays. And the speckled band was one of those plays. It was, it was the most successful one that he came up with. There were touring productions of it. It played in America Mm -hmm. An actor by the name of, who I'll share a picture of in a moment, H. <laughs> a. a. Saintsbury played oh, Sherlock yes. in it. And Saintsbury had been playing Sherlock already when he did the Speckle Band play. He had already been in that Doyle, William Gillette play, Sherlock Holmes. Yep. Um, and uh, and Saintsbury would go on to play Sherlock more than anyone else in history. It was like, it's approximately, it's over 1400 times he was Sherlock on stage. Oh, uh, interesting. Well, I mean, he was, he was, I was going to say, he's more than Gillette. Which yeah, it's is more than Gillette. Terrifying, but awesome. Um, J.M. Barry, mm -hmm. uh, author of Peter Pan, who was a uh, also a friend of Doyle, uh, mm -hmm. offered advice on the production um, that uh, he said, um, well, actually, Doyle wanted the villain. The, the villain in the play was uh, played by an actor by the name of Lynn Harding. And, mm. and Doyle is telling him to, like, you need to be, like, this this melodramatic, you know, stage villain. And Rylet's like, nah, I, I think I should be more subtle. I think that will work with the audience more. And Doyle actually asked Barry to intercede to, like, what should you do? And Barry, of course, said, like, no, he needs to be more subtle. Like, what are you, crazy, Arthur? Like, you can't have melodramatic stage villains anymore. This is the 20th century. Um, so uh, that held. And also, during the first run of the play, they used a real snake at the end. Um, yeah. And it was a very tame kind of boa that they could use mm -hmm. and... One of the reviews of the play said, um, like, oh, and then they have this ridiculous phony snake at the end. And Doyle was like, what? I can't believe, like, that was the real um, thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I sprung for realness. What the heck, guys? It was adapted into a film, uh, The mm -hmm. Speckled Band, um, with uh, Lynn Harding, again, as, uh, mm -hmm. as and, and, the, and the name's just slightly different. It's Rylot instead of Roylot. Um, yep. Lynn Harding played the villain and Raymond Massey. Uh, yes, he played Sherlock Holmes in that, and I was going to rewatch. I just didn't have time to rewatch it. It's, I didn't it's have time. Uh, my husband actually brought it up on the uh, YouTube, um, you know, playlist last night, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm not feeling it tonight." But it's a pretty good film, actually, and yeah, I always remember is. that I liked Raymond Massey in it. Um, I'm going to share and, a picture. Yeah. Actually, and Raymond Massey was actually the uh, bri briefly was the father-in-law of Jeremy Brett. 
Oh, that's did right. You know that? I, I think I did. Um, yeah, he, uh, he married Anna Massey back in the yeah. 60s and then they divorced. But uh, yeah, so basically, you know, former father in law and son playing Sherlock Holmes. But this is Saintsbury here playing Sherlock. Mm -hmm. This is from the play, too. Yeah. Um, it says at the top of this, you know, and it's what five, six images of him as Sherlock and, and yeah. the, the deer stalker and the smoking jacket and the, yeah. you know, picture with his pipe. And it says at the top, criminals beware, the hawk like eye. And then, and then it's all these weird, creepy eyes behind all these pictures. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Which I think well, is, you know, um, I think so what weird. you see, but you do not observe. In this case, you definitely see and observe. So. <laughs> and the bottom here has some text, and it is the undying Sherlock Holmes, Mr. St. Barry's representation of the Napoleon of detectives in the speckled band at the Adelphi. Well, um, it's comp as opposed to the Napoleon of crime. So. Yes. Uh, he has based his makeup closely on the late Mr. Sidney Paget's illustrations to the stories. And it says, um, <clears throat> it may be recalled that the title part in Sherlock Holmes was first played in London at the Lyceum in 1901 by Mr. William Gillette, who had previously produced the play in New York. And now it's Saintsbury playing Sherlock. So here he is. The man yes. who played Sherlock Holmes more than anyone else on stage, H.A. Saintsbury. Wow. And I will, I think there is a link to the play that was shared in our live chat here. You can find it there. Uh, mm -hmm. Also put it in the comments to YouTube as well. It's easy, it's, it's easy to find online, the Doyle Speckled Band play. Um, I actually saw an adaptation of it in Philadelphia just last year in 2022. Um, kind of jealous. It, it was it was it was at the Wanna Street Theater in Philadelphia, but it wasn't really the Doyle play. There's a really? there's a playwright by the name and an actor by the name of uh, Bill Van Bill Van Horn who had uh, did an adaptation of it for the Wanna Street Theater to do, mm -hmm. and he. He added a lot of funny scenes in it and he kind of okay. updated he updated the setting to 1920s, but but it was good. Uh it was a actor by the name. Um I can't um uh Ian Merrill Peaks with Sherlock Holmes in it, and Bill Van Hoor played Watson, the author of it. And uh, but there was a terrific actor by the name of Dan Hodge, who was uh who was in the play in two different roles. Um, and Dan Hodge is a terrific actor. But was also a co-host on our Sundays with Frankenstein Biblio Ventures. Uh, he played two roles in that production, so you can go watch uh, Sundays with Frankenstein if you're in a hanker for some Frankenstein. Oh, anyway, yes. all the multifaceted people. Oh my gosh, we're like a half hour into the show, and we're and we're finally getting to the story. Well, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm so I know. sorry. Very it's chatty awesome. today. Um, that's what I do. So, and that's what we do here, and that's it. I had originally set this. I know I'm, I'm 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 still going on. I originally my goal for all these shows was 90 minutes, and we've had a couple of them that have worked, but for the most part they don't. So I'm, I'm a therapist. I listen all day, so this is my opportunity to talk. So yeah, um, oh good. I'm, I'm so sorry, people. If people I'm, tune in and think like I shot this was 90 minutes, why is it so long? It's because I don't want to miss out on this kind of lovely conversation and also hitting all the things we want to hit in the story. So we're going to start it. Adventure number eight. Yes. And now all the stories are called that too. Yes, um, the adventure. Each story in the title itself is, this is in the in the yes. strand, it's adventure, adventure 8, and then it's the adventure of the Speckled Band. And then for the, at least this beginning run, the, all the stories, are, and for a while, I think, all the stories are the adventure of. And this is the adventure much, of the yeah. Speckled Band. Yeah. This one has, well... Watson really gives us a lot of stuff in his hello here and in the intro yeah. to the story. This, this 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 first paragraph is is rife with so much information. In, so gla much in glancing over my notes of the 70 odd cases, this is the eighth story of Sherlock Holmes. And now he's telling us there were 70, 70. Yeah. cases. Well, actually, there were. 10 cases already that have been published because study in scarlet and mm -hmm. uh sign of four uh over and then he says during which 
uh, during the last eight years that he studied Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. Now that's going to send chronologists in like a tizzy because it's like, then you got to figure it. Oh, so it's eight years from when this story. 1881. So it would be 1881. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And uh, so you've got, you know, to figure all that out. And then the story winds up in a little bit. He'll say, well, but don't worry. I'm not skipping stuff. We'll get back to it. He says, this is in April of 83 1883 yep um this is a problem for chronologists because then the story winds up being right after study in scarlet and so this is the second adventure since he knew watson and it doesn't seem yeah it's like the second or third adventure since he i mean well um yeah second or third actually it wasn't it would have been right after study in scarlet's the second or third adventure but also watson is basically writing in retrospect um i mean because he actually said, um, I think um, somewhere in here that, um, you know, uh, essentially that um, the death of the female protagonist is what allowed him to publish this case yeah. at all. And so, you know, it he's writing it in 1889, or at least publishing it in um, story chronology 1889, but the story itself takes place in 1883. So, um, you know, April- It was published 18... in 92. Exactly. So, Published yeah. in 92, but written by Watson in, you know, 80 or in 89 and then, but set in April of 83. Yes. Keep track of your dates, friends. You know, <laughs> you need a whiteboard and like arrows and yeah. Um, Doyle is not very good with the chronology and uh, keeping. <laughs> but that's why we play the game. <laughs> but for me, as a, as a Doylean, yes. the, the real kind of the real effect that happens here is that Mm -hmm. Doyle is creating this sense of history Mm -hmm. for these characters you know his strand readers have only had you know these stories for eight months many of them and um and but now he's creating the effect that Watson is writing about something that occurred eight years ago so it it makes it gives this depth this long history to these characters without him having to do anything except saying that Exactly. I mean, it's 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 brilliant um, in terms of like universe creating. And yeah. that's that's what we love about it is that, uh, you know, um, we'll just say chronology issues, notwithstanding, Doyle created one heck of a an amazing uh, universe with significant uh, significant depth. The. Um... And then Watson goes on to say to talk about how there were different kinds of cases. And then we did this in the last story too, where he was kind of recounting different kinds of stories that that would be told. Or two stories ago, I think in the Five Orange Pips, he talks about that. Yeah. Um, in this case, they're they're either tragic, comic, or strange. Um, mm-hmm. They're the you know the 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 ones that um, he his home seems to be involved with because he always wants the unusual or fantastic. He says, working as he did rather for the love of his art than for the acquirement of wealth, he refused to associate himself with any investigation which did not tend towards the unusual and even the fantastic. Yeah, Uh, I mean, isn't there like, there's a line, crime is commonplace. You know, um, I mean, it's basically, you know, everything is commonplace. Holmes is, is, basically driven towards the unusual yeah um you know that's why he does what he does is well, because yeah oh go ahead especially if you're not going to take money you know oh, that'd yeah. be interesting <laughs> exactly i mean it's 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 kind of what my uh my rates are on a fixed scale unless i remit them all together i think is another quote yeah. probably later on in the stories but you know it's it's about basically kind of like if it's interesting to me, I will take it. Um, and, um, you know, it, the money doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, which is cool. Uh, but it's it does also- have some well healed clients that, you know, then kind of subsidize the other cases that he Yeah. Gets King, King of Bohemia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a giant bag of gold for you. <laughs> yes. Oh, and, uh, you know, later on, you know, I, I can't remember which case, but like he works for the Pope at some point. And so, you know, of course, the certain gracious lady, he solved a mystery for her, too. And, you know, uh, Pope's got money. Pope's got money. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that's that's awesome. 
Uh, and then this is where Watson mentions, this is why he gets to write it, because a promise of secrecy was made at the time from which I have been freed during the last month by the untimely death of the lady to whom the pledge was given. So um, that's, you know, uh, you know, I could talk about it now because she's dead. Um, and we'll we'll get we'll I want to return to that at the end of the story because then it's not oh, mentioned totally. in the story, and it's really it's really important to recall that at the end of this story, especially oh, as absolutely. it's such a gothic story. Um mm -hmm. they um and and also the said he says because there are widespread rumors as to the death of Dr. Grimsby Roylot, which tend mm -hmm. to make the matter even more terrible than the truth. So he needs to help dispel some rumors yeah. about what happened. To Grimsby Roylot. Oh yes, um, yeah. Our 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 villain is 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 awful, is evil, is slimy, and um, you know <laughs> dies a very mysterious death, or at least from the outside, it's very sudden and mysterious death. Well, we've had a couple stories that have begun. Last story and Man with the Twisted Lip. We're not even in Baker Street ever in the story. We had a couple mm -hmm. stories that begin in Watson's uh um at least one and then one you know to follow this where we begin at watson's house um and uh and this one though we're in baker street and watson's are, there sleeping, sleeping and sherlock holmes wakes him up a little too early in the morning well yes uh what a a, a quarter what is it a quarter past seven and uh i think if somebody woke me up at a quarter past seven i'd be a little surly <laughs> Very sorry to knock you up, Watson. And Mrs. Hudson has been knocked up too. So, um, oh yes, a <laughs> phrase that is often used out of context. Um, Watson does that describing Holmes' abilities. Um, well, he's woken up because a young lady has arrived, and yeah. uh, uh, Watson talks about, you know, a, I wouldn't miss it for anything. So he's he's keen to get up. No oh, yeah. keener pleasure than in following Holmes in his professional investigations and in admiring the rapid deductions as mm -hmm. swift as intuitions and yet always founded on a logical basis. Mm -hmm. There always has to be some kind of encapsulation mm -hmm. of the abilities of Sherlock Holmes in these stories as because it's a it's a one off like each story is a one adventure. Exactly. So. It's a serial, um, you know, but, um, you know, every uh, every story is self-contained. Um, and so you're getting new readers every single story. And so you kind of have to do, you know, and last episode or, um, you know, and uh, this is Sherlock Holmes. So like a constant reintroduction of the character in very capsule capsule form. Yeah. The um, uh, Sherlock... Mm -hmm. also says to Watson that um, well no he says to to the lady who is dressed in black she's in mourning that's what that means everyone she's in mourning um, yeah. she would have to wear you know dress in black <laughs> for you know months six months at least you know yeah. if someone close to her has died yeah um, all of our correspondence would be written on paper that would have black borders around it to give mm -hmm. to let people know so this whole process of mourning that has to happen. Um, yeah. She's there and she, um, Holmes says to her, my name is Sherlock Holmes. This is my intimate friend and associate, Dr. Watson, before whom you can speak as freely as before myself. I oh, like yeah. that. Isn't that nice? Intimate friend and associate. Um, yes, which is also one of those phrases that is often taken out of context. Um slash fiction writers use that <laughs> a lot um, yeah i love it <laughs> yes although like i for for a an s or for a presentation title i did my intimate friend and dissociate dr watson um <laughs> you know um uh, dealing with holmes and the idea of dissociative feud with uh well a story that comes way down the um uh, the pipeline so mm -hmm. yeah well, they are, they are, it, it's a reminder that mm -hmm. these stories are, and Doyle constantly is doing this. I don't, I think it just comes out. It's just, yeah. they are friends. And, and yeah. Christopher Morley calls his first Sherlock collection, a textbook of friendship. Yeah. And it is about their kind of ongoing friendship through yeah. the years in these cases as well. They are the ride and die, so to speak, you know, um, I mean, you know, no matter, no matter what happens, 
it's Holmes and Watson. Watson can get married to one, two, three, six, 18 wives, depending on the chronology. It doesn't matter. Holmes is his ride and die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, uh, the woman here is shivering and mm -hmm. Holmes sees it. Yeah, I yeah. observe that you are shivering. And, uh, and she yeah. says, well, it's not because I'm cold. It is fright. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it is terror. Terror. Yes. Her face all drawn and gray with restless, frightened eyes like those of some hunted animal. She was a woman of 30, but her mm -hmm. hair was shot with premature gray. Mm -hmm. um, and and the idea, not that she's just gone gray because yes. some people do. That's really because of stress and fear. Yeah. All that stress, that strain in her life has turned her hair color. And there used to be. How do you explain your beard, Ed? <laughs> yeah. So there used to be a theory, too, that 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 happened, that like you could be frightened and your hair could go white rather quickly, too. And that's mm -hmm. that's I mean, it's been debunked. I mean, it, it's not true. Your hair doesn't completely turn white, but yeah. it are, but, but but stress does impact. Yes, a it lot does. Of yeah. Yeah, it, it it affects the the well, I'm not a scientist. It affects the things that do make that do produce the pigment for your exactly. hair. So it actually can a lot of stress and strain can actually take away the pigment from your hair, so your hair will go gray or white. Exactly. So there you go. Um, it's not completely you know unusual. Exactly. Uh, Holmes has to do his uh, his Dr. Joseph Bell trick here with mm -hmm. his observations. Uh, you know, you oh, I see you've had a good drive in a dog cart along heavy roads <laughs> because of the mud splash on her sleeve. And, you know, exactly. Uh, and they're on the left side of the dog cart because no vehicle save a dog cart exactly. <laughs> throws up mud in that way. Um so that's such a that's such a specific thing for him to know, right? <laughs> well, yeah. But I mean, it's also like, you know, one of the things that I love about Holmes and um, author Maria Kornikova did a really, really good job of kind of um, kind of explaining some of this stuff away in her uh, her book, uh, Mastermind, uh, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. Mm hmm About Holmes being a practitioner of mindfulness. And so, you know, like, he is constantly aware of the things that are going on. And because of what is established in um, uh, studying Scarlet and Sign of Four is that like Holmes's brain kind of retains anything that is useful to his um, profession. And so, you know, knowing the, uh, we'll just say kind of like the splatter patterns of the wheels of a dog cart would make sense. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of, um, you know, like I I can it, it's going to sound weird, but it's like I I can I can tell if somebody's been, um, you know, like uh, just by the um, I mean, and this is going to be very esoteric here, but I grew up in rural Wisconsin and we water skied, you know, we're like we're a very water skiing culture. And so just based on the spray pattern, I can tell which type of water ski per, uh, person is actually using. Mm. There yeah. All right. And so it's again esoteric, but you know it it, it makes sense given the uh, given the context of specialized knowledge. Water spatter. There you go. Exactly. Water water spray. <laughs> um, that's fascinating. Uh, the here's where this story then this is for me this is the first of the real kind of gothic tropes that happened in this story she says i shall go she says i can't stand the strain no longer i shall go mad if it continues i can turn to, to none save only one who cares for me and he poor fellow can be of little aid and mm -hmm. this story is filled with and i'll and i'll mention them every time we hit one these kind of gothic tropes where gothic stories are um traditionally happen in, in the Gothic tradition. It begins in the 18th century. It happen in remote areas, crumbling, decaying mansions or castles. There's yeah. a young woman being pursued by a powerful man. Um, uh, there's a there's some kind of curse involved in it usually. And I think that kind of happens here, um, although it's well, not an actual supernatural curse. Not, not an actual supernatural curse, but a curse of heredity. 
Yeah. Um, and we we can we can kind of get into that. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'm sure it's, a future, that it's a future paper um, that uh, my husband has told me that I need to write. So but she is she is a gothic heroine right here, you know, right off the bat. And that um, uh, she's going to go mad because of this experience that she's gone through. And frequently the gothic heroines, you know, state of mind is threatened. Um, and there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on in in old in the, in the whole gothic tradition, too, where she is being made to think certain things and you know and so that that's also at play here but we'll get we'll, we'll and we'll see all that and you've seen all that everyone as you've read the story that's all occurred in this story um she has been recommended um by uh her name is helen stoner but she doesn't say that yet um the, but helen stoner has says mm -hmm. she was recommended by um uh, a miss farintosh yes. and again this is another one of those you know, we get this kind of, you know, further deepening of the history of Holmes and the reader. This was another yeah, yeah. case that we don't know anything about. Exactly. Um, and uh, concerned with an opal tiara. Uh, I think it was before your time, Watson. Um, <laughs> Again, establishing timeline and depth. Here's here's the mood of the story really set by Helen Stoner. Um mm -hmm. You have this, read this alas paragraph. All right. Alas, our uh, replied our visitor, the very horror of my situation lies in the fact that my fears are so vague and my suspicion de uh, suspicions depend so entirely upon small points that uh, they might seem trivial to another. Uh, that even he, uh, to whom all others um, I have, uh, sorry, to whom all others I have the right to look for help and advice looks upon um all that i have uh, that i tell him about uh about it uh, sorry as the fancies of a nervous woman um he does not say so but i can read it from his soothing answers and averted eyes but i have mr holmes um that you see or that you can see so deeply into the manifold of wickedness of the human heart you know, um, you know, you may advise me how to walk amid the dangers which encompass me. I yeah. mean, that is powerful right there. And it's it it sets the mood and it is the um it is the words itself are are this is a got she's in a gothic novel and, and yeah. it's the vocabulary here horror, fears, mm -hmm. suspicions, yeah. nervous woman manifold wickedness of the human heart exactly. walk amid the dangers wow. which encompass, encompass me she's a gothic heroine come to life this is what her life has become for her exactly um uh those words that that he's choosing here to describe the situation are right out of the of of of, of that gothic tradition yeah um, someone mentioned last month's uh mm -hmm. slight tangent but i wanted to bring it up for the for the the last story we did, man with the twisted lips. Someone noticed uh, in the live chat. It was Betsy. Uh, I don't know if she's there today. That the word vile was seen to be used frequently. I looked it up in man with a twisted lip, and I think it's four times vile or vilest is used in the story. And I thought that's interesting. They, that word stuck in Doyle's head to keep bringing mm -hmm. out to really describe yeah. the kind of conditions that people were going through. And that's then then that word itself kind of gets to describe what this story is about it's about this vileness of people in some way um here we we'll have these words that come out horror fear suspicion nervous wickedness this is you know the kind of mood that he's creating in this story oh. um getting another drink there you go uh yes actually the the fun thing is this is bill's variation actually my husband bill is uh, my mixologist tonight uh bill what am i drinking you're drinking ishtar uh bentun ishtar bentun apparently which is a aztec or a mind liqueur combined with a little bit of absinthe to give it that green mm -hmm. color yep that we all know and love okay the um and with that is also some lime juice mm -hmm. and some jambui Ooh. to give it a little bit of scottish element to it because every Doyle. sherlock holmes fan loves it the well, scottish and the irish the because the well, irish because Doyle. Of british yeah but, uh, <laughs> Doyle was Scottish and Irish. The mm. uh, the rim is tahine and black pepper to give that speckled band. Ooh, around the rim. Oh, yes, he's, he's rimmed it with tahine, and there actually is a 
and black wonderful of uh, the tahini and black pepper and there's actually a little little uh, break in the um in the tahini rim for the vent uh for yep. where the snake came in yep there you uh, go bill you want my, my 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 disembodied husband everyone Thank i'm you. telling you that's fabulous cheers there you go thank mm -hmm. you bill cheers I, you get two I, different drinks through this show. So I, well I know. I am so lucky. <laughs> I need a bartender to tend to me during shows. <laughs> I, this is why I'm doing this one from home versus from the office. That's great. So. The story. My name is Helen Stoner. She's living with, I'm living with my stepfather, who is the last survivor of the oldest Saxon families in England. One of the oldest, the Roy Lots of Stoke Moran on the western borders of Surrey. And the, the family was at one time the richest in England, but four successive heirs were of a dissolute and wasteful disposition, and the family ruin was eventually completed by a gambler in the days of the Regency. They live in a 200-year-old a house there stoke moran i mean this is all the these are the gothic conventions too right the exactly the, the, the kind of family the, the long history of the family and this is where a kind of curse comes in that grimsby royal it is the is kind of inherited this you know dissolute uh wasteful disposition and they live in a 200 year old crumbling mansion exactly crumbling mansion in disrepair i mean you know again all the gothic elements that that kind of combine and here's one of the for for Doyle the kind of the modern you know 1890s Gothic you know curse kind of stuff. Um, Roylet, her stepfather, has gone to Calcutta, um, where by his professional skill and force of character he established a large practice. Mm -hmm. But his innate anger issues mm -hmm. have you know uh, um, uh, caused him to beat his native butler to death. I yeah, I mean, okay, so yes, well let, let's talk about degeneracy for a second. Um I mean, you know, there there's a couple of um like historical th this is actually where um as I was driving home from Wisconsin from the holiday weekend, uh Bill and I were listening to the Speckled Band and we were we were listening to this on audiobook and <clears throat> he picked up on this idea of heredity. Um, you know, that um, basically like Roy Lott's heredity, you know, uh, that there's violence in this. And um, there's like an entire like um, <clears throat> like uh, Victorian um, era idea of like degeneracy in um, in heredity in the blood. And so it's kind of like they kind of understood genetics, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. And so there was this whole idea that um, like... Um, the way that the genetics would combine would actually throw somebody back into something that or like into a form that was less evolved. Yeah. Thus the concept of de uh, degeneracy. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, with, with Roy Lott, to be perfectly honest, I, uh, based on um, some of the papers that I've written about uh, like vile blood and heter hereditary degeneracy in Victorian England, I have a paper that I really need to write on um, on Grimesby Roylott. What I find fascinating is it's it's this it's this idea of a gothic curse made mm -hmm. scientific for them exactly, uh, and uh, uh, and he and and for Doyle in his stories as we've seen and these kind of you know Victorian Empire stories it's always tied to the empire, to colonies. We get so many characters who go off to someplace else. And, yeah, and, and that, and, you know, in, in Boscombe Valley, he goes to Australia and he becomes, you know, this murderous robber, blackjack of Ballarat. And mm -hmm. um, uh, even Watson is, is, you know, kind of, you know, hurt by this wound that he suffered in, you know, another country. And they mm -hmm. all have these, you know, connections with, the colonial empire going out there. And then this awful thing that they come back with either for Roylet here, it's more Gothic even because it goes through his family and he's just taken it somewhere else. And now he's returned again with it. Um, but the connections are, are, are seem to be there always. Um, I wonder, has anybody, does anybody in, cause we haven't had one yet. I don't think has anybody gone to a colony and, and it's been a positive experience. 
No. <laughs> Not yet. And I don't know if it'll happen, but I'll have my, you know, eye out for it if that ever, you know, happens. It's it's um, it's kind of interesting though, because it's like Doyle, I know, like was very much um, you know, pro empire. Um, in in kind of his personal philosophy, but uh, everybody that goes out to these remote outposts, to the um, you know to the colonies, comes back transformed into something else. And yes. so I think it is. Um, I mean, it's 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 rather interesting that he's pro um, you know pro empire and pro imperialism, but also his characters actually seem almost anti-critical or yeah, anti, mean, you know, anti-empire. He recognizes that element in, you know, empire, you know, stories that in the British empire stories that he can always use for his, you know, for his fictions, but, but he is, you know, a, a very much, you know, you know, queen of the country. I'm all for the empire kind of person as, you but, know, uh, and, yeah. and I, as he gets older as well. Yeah, I mean, I I think in some ways it's um, it might be the recognition that homeland um, and queen and country, so to speak, or like England proper, is um, you know the kind of the heart of civilization, whereas um, the other aspects of the empire might be um, savagery, if you will, or like mm -hmm. frontier, and so people who are exposed to that level of um, savagery become savages th themselves is what I yeah. would imagine that Doyle is kind of creating the argument. Yeah. 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 Um, the, um, uh, her mother, uh, Helen's mother, Helen Center's mother has, yeah. uh, has died. Had, the, 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 she's, she's re she remarries Roylet. So mm -hmm. Roylet is, is Helen's stepfather. Um, and her mother, after they came back from India, dies in a railway accident. Yes. Um, another Gothic trope, the loss of the mother, left under the protection of an evil man that's something that happens mm -hmm. a lot of gothic stories yeah Roylet's temper here this in a fit of anger um that that he has and, and he that he also brings back with him is um uh he shuts himself up in his house he has quarrels with anybody who crosses his path mm -hmm. his violence of temper approaching to mania has been hereditary in the men of the family, as you were talking about there. And this mm -hmm. kind that's you know, that hereditary thing. That's a very gothic, that's the curse in the past that I'm yeah. talking about. Constantly yeah. fighting people, he is. Yeah. Um, even hurled the local blacksmith over a parapet into a stream. Um, we'll get to that. I'll show that picture in in in, yeah. in, in a bit when we well, actually when we when we meet him, I'll, I'll share the pictures of him from Sydney Paget. But first, I want to take this moment to thank everyone for watching or listening to Sherlock Mondays. Uh, the Rosenbachs community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach and Sherlock Mondays by donation, which you can do so at our website or by becoming a member. Membership gives you free museum admission, discounts on programs and courses, and exclusive invitations to member-only events, and also early access to registration for new programs and courses that we post. Uh, you can learn more about how to become a member or donate on our website. And remember that Rosenbach membership also makes a great gift. That was really gratifying to me in past shows that we've done is that we had several people who were gifted memberships by our uh, viewers of the show. So that was really nice. Uh, I can't stress how important your support is. So if you haven't made a donation or joined as a member yet or have the ability to make a further donation, I would be very grateful. You can also join us on our Facebook group page, Sherlock Mondays where we still talk about all kinds of things, Sherlock, and it's a lot of fun on the, on the Facebook group page. Uh, and you're on there a lot, Monica, which is really great. Yeah, I, I, I try. I mean, it's um, social media is, is a good way for us to uh, interact and connect. Yeah. With people. And, you know, it, it's important to be able to um, share the knowledge that we have and um, kind of connect it with the community because in the giant scheme of things, that's exactly what we're here for: is connection and um, you know creating a uh, creating a community. So, yes. yeah. So we just want to make sure that everybody intersects with the established Sherlockian community, um, if at all possible. 
There's also an audio podcast version of this show. Look for the Rosenback podcast, Sherlock Mondays, wherever you get your podcasts. The audio podcast drop one week after the video ones. So that's all I'm going to do today. I want to get back to this story. Also, on the estate of mm-hmm. Stoke Moran, Royla allows these uh, uh, wandering group of Roma to live on the estate. Um and he sometimes even goes off with them. Uh, and I think for people, especially for Doyle's, you know, original audience, that kind of makes him a real suspicious character, right? That he enjoys spending time with the Roma, um, who yeah. are always throughout, you know, Western history are always viewed as thieves and disreputable. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to be careful yeah. of those people. And Roy, that's the kind of guy that likes those dangerous people around him. Exactly. He keeps a cheetah and a baboon wandering freely over the grounds. How on earth you could possibly control those animals if they wander freely? I have no idea. Like, wouldn't they just be gone at some point? Um, Yeah, I mean, I I guess, you know, I mean, if one thinks of them as like free range, that's that's one thing. But uh you know, I mean, there there are certain like animals that roam free in the neighborhood. Um, like I have cats that roam free in my neighborhood. There you go. Be just and, like um, you know, so they 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 come home. You know, um, like we know that um, actually our neighborhood um, our neighborhood uh, tabby cat that just kind of wanders wherever is named Bob, and he belongs to the house uh, directly to the west of us. And um, you know, we give. Bob scritches when he comes up on our deck and hangs out in front of our windows. And, you know, um, I mean, it's it's kind of, he roams free, but he knows kind of where his boundaries are. So I imagine that, um, you know, perhaps a cheetah and baboon were uh, maybe trained to know kind of where the boundaries are. Mm-hmm. Perhaps. He does that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean the cheetah does especially well. The baboon is what they see. They never see the cheetah in the exactly. story. Exactly, so, you're not gonna see the cheetah. It's too fast, it's sneaky. It's cat. It's, it's not gonna let you see it. Um, but the baboon, he just comes walking in at one point when hopes of lots are there. Um, mm-hmm. Well, Helen tells Helen is one of twins, uh, and uh, her her sister Julia, um, she tells says was thirty at the time of her death. And her hair had also begun to whiten, even as mine has. Um, Julia had met um, uh, a man and was uh, a major, a half pay major of Marines. And she was engaged and she was going to marry him. And within a fortnight of the day, you know, of before their marriage, mm-hmm. um, they were, uh, she died uh, suddenly. And then this is where Holmes butts in, right? Pray be precise as to details. Now he's like, now he's really listening. Like, yes. This is important. Um, she says the part of the mansion, part of the manor house they live in is um, uh, only one wing of it is inhabited. So it'll have the, the front part of it, which is crumbling. And then there's a whole wing that's completely crumbling. And they live in another wing, which is at least kind of, you know, livable. Ish. Yeah. yeah. Gothic. I read there's a Gothic thing there. um her um sister uh tells her a story she's she uh julia has told helen that she keeps smelling she's troubled by the smell of the strong indian cigars which Mm -hmm. dr roylet um grimsby roylet was was smoking and um uh and then she says to her sister have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of the night i love that Yes, um, never said I. And and we get this conversation here that Helen is recounting the homes. But what I like about it is that Doyle Doyle just gives it as the conversation. So mm-hmm. it's like we're there. He j- because we just get the dialogue, and it kind of serves almost like as a flashback. Mm-hmm. Like she's telling Sherlock the story, and then suddenly we get a flashback to the two of them talking. Um, which you can do in a, in in a written narrative. It doesn't have to be a visual thing. That's the the effect yeah. that this has here. Um, mm-hmm. 
Never said I, uh, you couldn't whistle yourself in your sleep. Certainly not. Like, what? Are you saying I whistle in my sleep? Yeah, uh, like it's like saying I snore. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't snore. And uh, um, I don't snore. I stayed up all night one night and, and didn't hear me snore once. So, um, yeah, they, um, uh, so this whistle in the night um is again that's like a spooky thing i think that's a little gothic that she's yeah. hearing this weird sound in the night that she can't explain uh, also they lock their doors of their bedroom at night she says obviously because there's a baboon and a cheetah you never know if they might well, get and also out. those wretched gypsies so yeah. to speak those wretched roma yeah and she says we have no feeling of security unless our doors were locked so um uh, kind of a gothic you know mm -hmm. feeling there that no sense of security in the place that you're in mm -hmm. well now she tells the how what happened when her sister died first it was a vague feeling of impending misfortune oh yes this night um and uh they were twins so they have the, the mm -hmm. twin link that exactly. you know twin link they know they can they can each you know feel what the other is going through um and uh which i is very legitimate from what i hear from twins um it was a wild night she says the wind was howling outside it's very gothic right and yeah. um she hears a scream uh uh from uh, uh, she heard the wild scream of a terrified woman that's obviously her sister um, yeah. she she hears the whistle herself yeah the clanging sound as if of a mass of metal had fallen and mm -hmm. these are the things that clearly these are the details yes, Sherlock these, these these are away. Important. yeah and then again as i mentioned in another story <clears throat> this is this is the the this audience in the 1890s learning how to read mystery detective stories mm -hmm. when clues come up and knowing that like when little details like that are put this is a detail to figure exactly. out the mystery. Exactly. Um, they um, her sister comes out of the room, her face blanched with terror, hands groping for help, swaying. She writhed as one who is in terrible pain, and her limbs were dreadfully convulsed. Oh my god, Helen, it was the band, it was the, band. It was the speckled band, the speckled band. Like, that's my line. <laughs> <laughs> she stabbed with her finger into the air in the direction of the doctor's room, Grimsby Roylet. Um, and he comes running out and he does the thing that all doctors do. He poured brandy down her throat because quick, the brandy. That's, brandy. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So, thank you. I would be I would be quite happy to be a patient in the 19th century, let me tell you. Likewise. Yes. They'd be just giving me brandy every day um, yes brandy brandy and more brandy i'd get sick a lot let me tell you um holmes asks are you sure about that let, let, let's let's see that scene as sydney paget uh, had illustrated it of her of her sister coming out of the room um this is it in the text um she's in her um in her nightgown yep and helen's in her um uh, has a put through has thrown a shawl over herself at least the uh, the look of the dazed yeah. look of perhaps fear on on Julia's face here. Mm -hmm. And then I die. The hands in the air. There's a shadow here coming from Helen. Um, mm -hmm. Place is a little Spartan. Paget himself doesn't go kind of crazy with the with the gothic, you know, mm -hmm. setting up things here. Mm -hmm. um, very simple, uh, just her and her gown, looking terrified. Mm -hmm. Um. Holmes wants to make sure of the details. Um, then, you know, the whistle, the metallic sound, could you swear to it? Yeah. Uh, she says that she also had her, uh, the charred stump of a match uh, in her hand. Um, and her left uh, a matchbox. Yeah. And it left a matchbox. So it just, she was just struck a light before she wandered out. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Holmes then asked about the, well, she tells him about the room. The door was fastened on the inside. The windows are blocked by old-fashioned shutters with broad iron bars. 
the walls were sounded, so they're solid. The floor is examined, so the chimney is barred up. So Basically, it's a locked room mystery. It's a locked room mystery. Like mm -hmm. she, something happened to her inside a locked room, and there's no clue. There's no, well, there's no, no one knows how it happened to her. There are clues because Sherlock finds the clues later. And we have some of the clues here that have been given. Um, they link the um, the speckled band right away with the Roma um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the band, the speckled band that they would wear some kind of scarf, handkerchiefs that are spotted. Um, uh, but Holmes is still, he, he shakes his head. He's far from satisfied. These are very deep waters. Pray go on with your narrative. So um, he's yeah. he's concerned right away that this is a yeah. this is a very serious thing here. Like, and it's nice because he's been so he's comforted her earlier. Is like, oh, don't worry, we'll you know everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. He says to her early on when he first meets her, um, that that compassion comes out of him that I think gets you know ignored in Holmes. Yeah. Um, the um, uh, he also uh, here is letting her know that in a sense that she's not crazy like this isn't exactly. like you didn't imagine anything you're telling me things and i believe the things you're telling me yeah and i mean that's something that happens <clears throat> frequently is the gaslighting of women yeah. is it's like we're you know women are told oh you didn't hear that even though they know they heard that yeah you, know, you didn't see that even though they know they saw that i mean it's it's um i mean the, it's the what the 1945ish movie gaslight kind of is is where the term comes from in terms of gaslighting but um you know actually a play somebody, and then it was two movies yeah. that 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 movie you're talking about is the second movie actually is oh, that, actually the first movie is actually really good too i i haven't seen the first movie i know that I, I i know the second movie but not the first but uh you know regardless though is, is that um i mean it, it really is about uh, making women feel like they they're crazy for thinking the things that they think or for observing the things that they observe. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much what happened with Helen. Yeah. She gives a little more of her story. She is now engaged to Percy Armitage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, she is, the, the, there's been some repairs on the house, the part of the house they live in. So she's had to now move into the bed chamber that her sister died in and she lies awake at night uh, thinking that, you know, um, she, but she's heard the, she says, I have heard the low whistle in the night. Um, and she lights her lamp and she didn't see anything. Um, and then that's her story. And then Holmes says, you have, Miss Stoner, you have not, uh, you have not told me all. You are screening your stepfather. Mm -hmm. And he pushes back the the lace on her the frill on her uh hand uh, on her sleeve and she has five little livid spots the marks of four fingers and a thumb were printed upon the white wrist you have been cruelly used said holmes um she apologizes for 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 the abuse um he is a hard man and perhaps he hardly knows his own strength that's not unusual, right? For not in this, not in this era. I mean, in this era, essentially, women were told that uh, whatever happened to them uh, was their fault. And yeah. um, you know, I mean, I I did an essay on uh, looking at spousal abuse in the canon, and uh, women didn't have a lot of rights at this point. And so, you know, the general overall philosophy was that um, if a woman was being abused, it was her fault. Yeah. Yeah, so she too did. often too often it still happens um, that, that 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 still occurs. Um, but Holmes is having none of it. He knows that there's you know he wants to point it out. He knows that there's something wrong here. He says this is a very deep business. There are a thousand details which I should desire to know before I decide upon our course of action. Yet we have not a moment to lose. He knows the danger exactly. is immediate here, not only from what he's heard, but yeah. from. The, the the case that he recognizes that she is literally in a dangerous situation mm -hmm. and that her stepfather has abused her and exactly. he needs to, and he needs to, exactly. to 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 fix this so um she leaves he tells watson this is a most dark and sinister business again this is you know mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's kind of gothic but it's also just more general mood you know yeah. setting um uh 
um the um the, the they're they're kind of talking about the um Holmes Holmes asked Watson about oh Holmes tells Watson you know we're going to go to Stoke Moran right away you know mm-hmm. and then what in the name of the devil <laughs> oh my gosh oh my Holmes gosh says, let's burst in and in walks Dr. Grimsby Royalette and I'm going to I'm going to share that I'm going to share that in the pageant um oh yes the pageant Grimsby. illustration is lovely yeah here he is coming bursting in there he is. Oh, I, I think Paget could have made him bigger. <laughs> Paget probably should have made him bigger, but like you know, he's at least that, his head is up. His this hat is all the way up here at the yeah, uh, which, is, which, the which, is, which is true. So he's got a couple of inches on Holmes, and they're they're kind of back here a little bit from him. But but I I think even bigger, I would have like if Doyle was overseeing the illustrations mm-hmm. and gotten it, I think it would have said even bigger, bigger, exactly. But the look on his face is is fairly, you know, fierce. And he's holding this, you know, riding crop in his hand. Exactly. I mean, he's desperately trying to look intimidating and he's succeeding. We know Holmes is good with the riding crop. He's used that before in um, um, Eligible Bachelor. Mm-hmm. Um, he pulls out the whip, the riding crop at the end. And and uh, James Windebank goes running um from him uh royal bursts in you know kind of huge and evil he's described as a huge man um uh the hunting crop in his hand his hat actually brushed the crossbar of the doorway his breath seemed to span it across from side to side and he was marked with every evil passion mm. uh, deep set bile shot eyes um the nose gave him a look of a fierce old bird of prey. Which of you is Holmes? And um, uh, comes in challenging right away. Exactly. It's it's it's. I'm trying to establish dominance. I'm trying yeah. to establish myself as the alpha. But Holmes parries. Yeah. You know, says, you know, my name, sir. You know, but you have the advantage of. And he gives a name and then and then and then Holmes just won't answer him, right? He exactly. says, My daughter was here or my stepdaughter, and what has she been saying to you? And he's like, It it is a little cold for this time of year. Yeah. I've what heard she's been saying to you. I heard the crocuses come out. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love I love that Holmes is just like, you know, whatever. I'm gonna make random small talk. And then the famous insult, read that. Oh, what? Uh, Holmes, the busybody. Holmes, Holmes the meddler first. Yes, Holmes, the meddler. Holmes, the busybody. And Holmes, the Scotland Yard jack in office. The worst insult you could give. To oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that he would be. Constabulary. <laughs> he says that, yeah, that he's that he that he would connect me with the, you know, with the police. Oh, my gosh. That's the thing that's well, most annoying that he will he will say later. Well, Roylet says, you know, I'm a dangerous man to fall foul of. And and he picks up the, the iron poker from the from the fireplace and he bends it in half. And then he throws it and leaves. And uh um Holmes, you know, picks it up and he's like, Oh, I wish you know he had stayed. I would have shown him and he bends it back. <laughs> exactly. Um and the and the insolence to confound me with the official detective force. Um, yeah. So, but they've now that now it's confirmed. You know, Holmes knows there's a dangerous thing going on, and sure enough, you know, stupidly, Royalist shows up there to threaten him, which is pretty much saying, "Yes, of course, there's you know, I'm dangerous, and that's precisely what he shouldn't be doing." Exactly. Uh, Holmes goes off to investigate. Now he goes to Doctors Commons. If, if people don't know, that's the that's the court building where they have records of marriages and wills. Um, the doctor in the title refers to Doctors of Law. That's why it was called Doctors Commons. It, 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 it pops up in Dickens a lot. Dickens actually worked in there and did you know kind of uh, work where he would uh, transcribe what went on in the Doctors Commons uh, in the, in the court cases there. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Uh, they're going to go off to Stoke Moran. Uh, oh, he finds out that the will, what, yes. what Holmes finds out is the will, right? Yeah, the the will essentially uh, is like a thousand, uh, like eleven hundred. Oh, yeah, can't has English. Eleven hundred pounds, but because of um, you know essentially the fallen ag agricultural prices, yeah, which, the economy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as, as as an Iowan, I know a lot about ag agricultural <laughs> prices. Um, you know the because of the fall in that, um, you know it's worth about seven hundred and fifty pounds, and so if each daughter marries they are entitled to 250 pounds um you know each and so that's 750 pounds basically divided um you know with 250 pounds um you know div um you know subtracted because of of like um julia's uh marriage and uh, 250 pounds subtracted because of helen's marriage basically leave grimesby roylott um with nothing yeah practically nothing well, very little i mean Not a third of what he had in but, order you know, to maintain the state yeah he already can't he already can't maintain it it's already the place is already falling apart exactly uh, and this would take away every bit of his living and um uh, and so so now we have motive so we've had we've had little clues that we, holmes has still has to figure out but he at least has the clues and now we have motive and it's interesting because usually before he even goes someplace, we'll, we'll, we'll address this later, he knows more than we think he knows. Sometimes he's figured it out and he just goes to a scene to then confirm what he already knows. Exactly. Um, and uh, But here he's also now found motive as well. So they're going to go there and, and his advice to Watson, bring your gun and your toothbrush. So it's all you need, right? You know, you're going off off the danger. That's all you need. A gun and a toothbrush, everyone. Remember. Exactly. Um, gun, toothbrush, we're good. <laughs> um they um uh go to the train um uh and then and and at Waterloo and they get off and they get into the uh the carriage, the trap to ride, and Holmes pulled his had his hat pulled down over his eyes, and all I'm thinking of, oh is it a deer stalker? But we don't, it doesn't say that it's, you know, the, the kind of country hat. Um, what I love. The Jeremy Brett version totally does. Yeah. That. They do the deer stalker in the, in the Jeremy Brett and the Granada. Oh, and, but it's totally pulled over his eyes. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I was, I was observing that. I was looking for that last night when I rewatched that. And uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be seen. He would be wearing, if he's going out into the country, he's not going to wear his top hat. He's going to wear, well, he does wear a hat, but it's not the right hat. Because you see a hat later, and it's unfortunate that it's not a deer stalker. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but they're going to visit an estate, and with a lady there as well. So maybe it's, you know, a more appropriate for him to wear different, a different kind of hat. Um, they arrive, um, they meet, they meet her outside. Um, Roylet's not back yet. Mm -hmm. And they see the building, and it is, of course, a very gothic building. Uh, the building was of gray lichen blotched stone um, the, 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 with two curving wings, like the claws of a crab thrown out on each side. When one of the wings, the windows were broken and blocked with wooden boards while the roof was partly caved in a picture of ruin. And um, uh, they're not they don't live in that part. They live in the other wing. But also there was. The, it was an ill-trimmed lawn. Oh my gosh! He doesn't even have the lawn taken care of outside of his estate. What kind of landowner is he? Oh my God! Yeah, you know, like <laughs> the, the horror. I mean, I mean, granted that that actually persisted uh, to this day. Like in, even in my neighborhood, if you don't have your lawn trimmed, oh my God, you heathen you. <laughs> <laughs> well. People used to in the eight and this be, this begins in the eighteenth century. They would kind of create these gothic ruins where they would yep. specifically create buildings or uh, partial buildings on their estate, which were looked like they had been there for hundreds of years and were crumbling away. And they were new; they created them that way. But I can't recall any kind of you know accounts of you know the picturesque landscaping where they would actually not cut the lawn to the house. So. No, like right. I mean, you know, but again, you know, it just shows the level of disheveledness of of everything. Yep. 
I mean, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I, I, I like living in a neighborhood, I, I feel like this almost, uh, you know, uh, we'll just say unstated, but very powerful kind of pressure to make sure my lawn is, is perfectly manicured and cut. So, you know, the fact that it was like, oh, the lawn is unkempt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 it basically like it's, it's a judgment about, you know, just their ability to maintain. He's a country landowner. This exactly. is his job. This is the one thing he is supposed to take care of. Is exactly. Estate, and he doesn't take care of the estate. Exactly. Ill-trimmed lawn. Well, now Holmes is going to investigate the scene. He finds out that 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 the, the repairs going on that have made her move into the into the other bedroom seem unnecessary. That there doesn't I don't, he doesn't know why they've started repairs. Everything's fine. Um, he investigates the bedroom that she has to go in, the bedroom that her sister was killed in. Um, I like how he um, he looks around and then he. Holmes drew one of the chairs into a corner and sat silent while his eyes traveled round and round and up and down, taking in every detail of the apartment. Mm -hmm. I like that. Well, yes. like, first, I'm going to sit and I'm going to examine everything. Exactly. And then and then he gets up and he's you know, on the floor and he's looking at things and touching things. He um he realizes the bell pole. Yes. Oh yes. Um, well, I I passed the, that. The drink effect, is called uh, the bell pole. We were doing the bell, the snake on the bell. There we go. Um, the bell pole is fake. That it's just it doesn't ring for the servants. It's just attached to a hook. Mm -hmm. He also finds that there's a ventilator that opens into another room, exactly. which is ridiculous. Why didn't they put the ventilator to open to the outside? That's the purpose of it to ventilate to let air in. Um, and that he also finds out that those details were actually mm -hmm. added to the room right before her sister took over. So they did repair. So Grimsby Royalet did repairs to the house and to that room, and they were they were added to it. Mm -hmm. And then he doesn't find any fake, you know, he doesn't find any, you know, trap, you know, secret passages or trap doors or anything. Um but he does um uh the bell rope oh then they then they go and they look in the other room first mm -hmm. um and he looks in her uh in Grimsby Royal's own bedroom yes and there's a large safe mm -hmm. and then he asks um there isn't a cat in it for example That's no cat no, because there's a saucer of milk on the top of it. Um, and she says, she offers, well, there is a cheetah and a baboon. <laughs> yes, the cheetah and the baboon. Um, no. Yeah, actually, the funny thing is when, when I got my investiture as, as Julia Stoner, uh, my husband, who, bless him, he is kind of Sherlockian adjacent, Um when I told him you're speaking to Julia Stoner BSI, he actually said, he's like, you're not getting a tattoo of either a snake, a baboon, or, you know, a cheetah. <laughs> I'll just accessorize then. And there you go. Like, yeah. So yeah, all the fun things. Um, the, uh, so these are clues here, more clues, safe, bowl of milk and then he, Holmes wonders about there's a little dog lash there but the end is tied into a loop so to make it a little I guess kind of like a little lasso yeah like a little lasso for whatever creature might be lurking he says what do you make of that Watson Watson's like what does what do you she's like I don't know you know I don't know why it's tied mm -hmm. Holmes says what, what does he say there ah me it is ah yes it is oh, a wicked oh. world, and when a clever man turns his brain to crime, it is the worst of all. Oh, yes. So Holmes has pieced it together. Now he knows what's going on. Yeah. Um, he's he not going to tell anybody yet because, you know, he doesn't like to tell anybody anything when he figures it out. He likes the big production to finish things. Oh, very much so. Even though that would put people he's, in danger. He's, he, what, he's got a, a flair for the dramatic, right? Yeah. Watson even notices, he says, my friend's face so grim. He had, I had never seen my friend's appliance. Um, 
In the first place, both my friend and I must spend the night in your room. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, um, it's scandal, <laughs> scandal, scandal. Like, like who is coming into my room in Victorian um, England? Really? Yeah. So he lets her know, give him a light in the window to signal. She'll leave the room and then they'll come in and uh, and, yeah. and have a stakeout there at night. Exactly. Um, and uh, she even noticed, she says, you, you have already made up. She says, I believe, Mr. Holmes, you have already made up your mind. And he's like, perhaps I have, but he wants his clearer proofs. That's mm -hmm. what he always wants. Um, they leave and they go stay at the little um, inn. Um, and uh, and then they come back at night and they're in the room. Like, it's all very quickly. Like, Doyle's like moving the story along. We don't need to. Exactly. It's, it, it actually kind of moves at a lightning pace. It's yeah. kind of boom, boom, boom. And, uh, you know, then it, it brings us back to the action. And we have this nice little affectionate chain exchange between Holmes and Watson. Uh, you read Holmes there. Do you know Watson? Oh, um, give me one sec. Let me find that. My husband is actually refilling my drink right now <laughs> because best gin, uh, my, my husband who is ginger is fabulous and best ginger Ooh. ever. Thank you, Bill. Bartender on cue. I'm telling you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I'm sorry. The, uh, the cue was, do you know Watson? Okay. Do you know, give me one sec here. Finding that. Do you know Watson? Holmes or said Holmes as we sat together in the the gathering darkness. I really have some scruples as to or as to taking you to or tonight. Um, you know, is there a distinct element of danger? Can I be of assistance? Your presence might be invaluable. Then I shall certainly come. It is very kind of you. I love that little, it's just a very, it's very slight, but it's an affectionate exchange. That Sherlock is concerned for Watson's safety and he needs to let him know that like there could be danger. And of course, Watson's like, damn it, you know, you know I'm coming. Exactly. It's like, duh, of course I'm coming. He and wants the danger. That, that, that's, a, that's a theme throughout uh, yeah. or throughout the, the Sherlockian canon is that Watson genuinely wants the danger. And above and beyond that, but, um, you know, like, um, I I just did a presentation a couple, uh, actually a couple of weeks ago about um, Watson's PTSD uh, within the Sherlock Holmes stories, um, you know, looking at uh, the mental health diagnosis of PTSD and kind of running towards the danger um, is in some ways part of that, that um, that's where he feels most comfortable and most at home because the chaos the danger is reminiscent of what he saw on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that this is again, in line with that, um, you know, Doyle in Doyle's era, we wouldn't call it PTSD. We wouldn't even call it shell shock, but it is, we'll just say kind of a known quantity nonetheless. I love all that stuff you've done with Watson and, and that, you know, PTSD. I, I, yeah. I have fun with mental health. Um, I mean, it's 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 fun helping people understand what men, um, various mental health diagnoses look like, but also mm -hmm. it's a fun way of looking at the literature and yeah. you know, in, well, in I, I think it's interesting and it, it, it does that it does that thing that I always want is that I have my perspective and and, and to learn more about things, exactly. it's other 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 perspectives come in and 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 then I can see even more, and that enables me to see more in these stories. Exactly. I mean, and and that's one of one of the things that I also love is that every every Sherlockian kind of has their own little area of expertise, and yeah. when they engage in the scholarship, that is um, lending itself to deepening the level or the stories. And um, you know, it it wasn't until I sat down with the idea that. Watson might have PTSD that I started or I started examining the stories with um, a little bit more of a critical eye. Yeah. And then every instance of Watson kind of running towards the danger as compared to running away from the danger, um, you know, kind of made a little bit more sense within the context of the stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So, so well, 
home first Holmes is affectionate towards Watson, and then he reminds him how he's not as smart as he is. Because um, <laughs> that's what Holmes does. I imagine you saw all that I did, but you didn't catch this stuff. And he talks about he says, I knew we would find the ventilator before mm-hmm. we came there because she could smell the cigar. Um okay. you know, and and then he gives him the clue, he gives him the clues, but mm-hmm. he's given the reader the clues too. Exactly. Hey, everybody, as you're reading the story for the very first time, here it is. A ventilator is made, a cord is hung, and a lady who sleeps in the bed dies. Does that not strike you? Oh, we didn't mention the other thing about the bed. The bed is bolted to the floor. The bed oh, is bolted right? to the floor. So the bed. Oh, that's that's clamped. what he mentions now. He then he asks him, "Did you notice the bed was clamped to the floor?" Exactly. And, um. Uh. Why would the bed be clamped to a floor? Well, mm-hmm. you know, he because says that way. Yeah. Uh, well, why would the the band? Uh, sorry, the bed be clamped to the floor? Yeah. Um, give me one sec. Let me get that. Uh, floor. Um. See, bu- 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 um, the lady, um, you know, could not move her bed. It must always be the same, uh, or in the same relative position to the ventilator and and to the rope. So, or so as we may call it, um, you know, since it was clearly never meant to be a bell pull. And so yeah. you've got, um, you know, you've basically got a bell pull right next to the bed, and thus a venue for whatever creature hiss. Because this is. Them. This is a Playfair mystery story, like you know exactly. the 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 um that that we've had before in this. That yes, um, man with the twisted lip was this too. You you have all the information that Holmes exactly. has, and now, in this story he's even teasing us with. He's even he's even pointing it out like this. These are all the central clues, and you know we can't figure it out. Um, exactly. or or we're not ready to make that jump. We should be many ready to make that jump. If you've ever read Poe's Murders in the Room Morgue. Of course. I'll mention that again later when we when we get to the end here. But um the um Watson doesn't see it all. And mm-hmm. then <clears throat> Holmes says um uh that this Watson says we are only well Watson starts to see it, he says. He says, I seem to see dimly what you are hinting at. Do you really, Watson? Um but really dimly. We are only just in time to prevent some subtle and horrible crime. And Holmes says, when a doctor does go wrong, he is the first of criminals. Oh. He has verve, he has nerve, and he has knowledge. Hold on one second, because that's the BSI Press Medical nerve and um, Examination, Nerve and Knowledge. It's basically looking at uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, the Sherlock Holmes canon and doctors. Um, so basically the medical profession and its follow-up. Um, hold on one second. That, not that one. Stimulating medicine. So there's two. There you go. Part of the fun of uh, being the uh, sales, uh, basically the sales manager <laughs> for BSI Press is I have all of these things. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's got nerve and knowledge. I mean, you know, um, basically a doctor gone wrong. Yeah. Is the most terrible of, um, yeah. of villains. And, you know, I don't I don't disagree, but it's also um, Doyle slash Watson, depending on who we or whether we're playing the game or not, essentially stating that, um, you know, uh, doctors are not stupid people that they are people who are able to think and to think abstractly and to think differently than others. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, when they go bad, they go bad in very creative and abstract ways and therefore make very difficult uh, uh, criminals that are hard to track. Well, he mentions two, two, you know, famous doctors, Palmer and Pritchard. They were both doctors who po- they were in real life who poisoned oh, yeah. their wives and family members to collect exactly. insurance money um, and were very famous. Um, so exactly. so this is what they're up against. But before, let us have a quiet pipe and turn our minds for a few hours to something more cheerful. So <laughs> let's have a pipe and relax before we mm-hmm. go off to the to the house again. They have their um, <clears throat> they have this silent vigil. Uh, they they go back to the house, and that's where they have this silent vigil in the room, mm-hmm. um, and uh, waiting for it to happen. Uh, they hear the whistle, and um, uh, actually, before they get in, they see the baboon as they're going into the house. They they see uh, 
uh, a hide- what seemed to be a hideous and distorted child and threw itself on the grass with writhing limbs and ran swiftly across the lawn into the darkness. You know, Watson's like, my God, did you see it? And Holmes, you know, is startled, but he's like, oh, it was the bad thing. nice Don't house, worry. Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It is a nice household, which, of course, is like the, um, you know, the, the we'll just say that's kind of like the um, uh, the tagline for the speckled band of Boston. It's a nice. Household. <laughs> well, they go in the room and they have their vigil. Um, tells Watson, don't go to sleep. And Holmes had brought a long, thin cane and he's got a box of matches and the stump of a candle. And then they. um they see a little light in the direction of the ventilator mm-hmm. and then they hear uh, the whistle, which comes like a very gentle, soothing sound like that of a small jet of steam escaping continually from the kettle. Um, Holmes strikes the match. You see it, Watson, you see it. And Watson, he says, but I saw nothing. I saw nothing. Uh, at the moment when Holmes struck the light, I heard a lurk low clear whistle um the sudden glare flashing into my weary eyes made it impossible for me to tell that it was at that what it was at which my friend lashed so savagely Mm -hmm. um but his face was deathly pale and filled with horror and loathing it's a very famous um illustration from sydney paget oh yes and uh the jeremy brett version very painstakingly during the end credits basically tries to recreate yeah this exact image there he is. I, I love the jeremy brett series for that he's got the holmes has the you know in the pageant illustration he's got the he's the match here it looks like or has he lit the candle already and he's holding yeah, the, he's, top of the candle it, look, it looks like the top of a candle that it's and, this and he's about to strike curved cane as he's about to swing but we don't see what he's swinging at it's all it's exactly it's, it you, you can't see it yet but it but it's also in a sense it's all about holmes <laughs> It's all about Sherlock and his exactly. heroic pose lashing out. Although his face looks startled and frightened here. He doesn't look like determined so much as like as, horrified. Yeah. At what he's yeah. seeing and he needs to lash out at. Yeah. Um, it is the snake that has come crawling down the bell pole. Um, <clears throat> and as he smacks it, then um, Watson hears uh, a, a horrible cry the most horrible cry to which i have ever listened uh from the other room a hoarse yell of pain and fear and anger all me all mingled in the one dreadful shriek the, that cry raised the sleepers from their beds Ooh. and Death they go spring. in they find dr grimsby Roylott clad in a long gray dressing gown Uh, His chin was cocked upwards and his eyes were fixed in a dreadful, rigid stare at the corner of the ceiling round his brow. He had a peculiar yellow band with brownish speckles, speckles band, which seemed to be bound tightly round his head. The band, the speckled band, whispered Holmes, (laughs) well done. Um, It is a swamp adder, the deadliest snake in India. He has died within 10 seconds of being bitten. Violence does, in truth, recoil upon the violent, and the schemer falls into the pit, which he digs for another. Ooh. Boom. It's... First, the swamp adder. Ah! Uh, it doesn't actually exist. <laughs> yeah, but no, well, no one has... It has not been discovered yet. Um, yeah, we're going to go with that. We're going to say, say that Holmes knows... Yet about a snake that he refers to as a swamp adder that kills you that quickly yeah um i mean you know researchers essentially have determined that this is um you know the uh the russell's viper essentially which is what my necklace is actually patterned after is the russell's viper thus the speckled band you know uh that you get the uh you know the speckled yellow and brown in here yeah but um yeah it's uh you know the russell's viper is is terrifying it's scary it appears on my spoon um, you know, that it was was given to me as a gift. So I've got uh, you know, the uh the delightful snake that is mm-hmm. you know, um spoon fed with milk. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, the it's wonderful and amazing. And also, um, yeah, we'll just say not based in reality whatsoever. <laughs> I love how the, um, that Holmes points it out, the band, the speckled band, that's yes. what the, what the clue is, which is, which is also for me, it's kind of like the lesson here. If you're dying, don't use metaphorical language. Don't say the speckled mm. band. Say it was a snake, okay? Um, but yeah. I guess I guess Julia Thank didn't know it was a snake. She just saw a speckled band. She doesn't really know what it is. But yeah, she may not know what it is, but like she could have been like danger noodle, you know, yeah. or or something. Um, but Holmes does have a lesson, and it's interesting because uh, it it. If it sounds almost biblical, it's because it is. Yeah, that's because Doyle put it there because why violence not? does in truth recoil upon the violent and the schemer falls into the pit which he digs for another. Um, it's in in the Baron Gould annotated. It's also in the Les Klinger annotated. It's from Ecclesiastes 10, 8. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it and whoso breaketh and hedge a serpent shall bite him. So... You know, it's a, it's Holmes's paraphrase of of, of yeah. this kind of a, a rare moment for Holmes to be kind of you know philosophical bib and biblical philosophical oh, yeah. about about okay. justice here, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, at the exact same time, like Holmes is, I mean, as much as a lot of people would like to think that Holmes is an atheist. Um, you know, and I'm one of those people who would like to think that um, he's not. You know, he, um, you know, he does quote the Bible quite often. He does. Um, you know, and, um, you know, does look at kind of like what the general overall like populace is looking at in terms of moral and ethical code. And, you know, Holmes basically is referencing Ecclesiastes here. You know, looking at, um, you know, violence being recoiled against the violent. Hiss. <laughs> now in the story, let's try to get to the end. Um, mm -hmm. They um, now's where he explains it. He describes his process, you know, and this is it's um, not only it's not only very, you know, necessary in a Playfair mystery, which we've just had. But in which you had all the clues, you also could have thought, hmm saucer of milk something's in the safe he also keeps animals maybe it could be a snake because the bell pole something's something's got to come through the ventilator down the bell pole to the plant you know like i know it's a stretch it's like you've really got to make leaps of you know faith in your logic to come up with this but it is there but that's also this this him describing everything here at the end this is one of the key concepts of the mystery story as created by Poe. Yes. Ground Poe and Murders in a Room Morgue, in which it's not the crime itself, and it's not even the solution at the end, but it's how the detective figured it out. And that's the kind of thing that Poe thought would be interesting, something in a new key, which is how he described it in his stories of, with about Auguste Dupin solving mysteries that people would find interesting, and they did, and, and it went on to inspire all mystery detective stories in a sense after that, but, but certainly yes. Sherlock Holmes as Doyle always acknowledged. Um, and it's especially, it's especially apt here because murders in the room morgue, I'm sorry, 140, 60 years, however, since it's been published. Yeah, uh, sorry, spoilers. It, it ends with an animal did the murder and, and there's an animal doing the murder. And I, I think that there's an absolute nod to Poe in this story and that it ends with, it was an animal at the end that did this. But of course, in Poe's story, it's just it happens naturally. The animal's just on the loose. Here it is someone directing an animal. More evil, that's Doyle's touch on the story is that it's someone using an animal to commit the crime. Yep. Um. Holmes uh, goes back to the speckled band and he's like how that just that phrase threw him off because he thought it was the 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 band of Roma around the house. Um, uh, someone I can't remember somebody mentioned to me. I don't know if it was on the Facebook page or not that they were surprised that Roylet would choose to kill his second daughter stepdaughter the same way. Yeah, like 
wouldn't that look so suspicious, right? Like two unexplained deaths in the same room. Like, isn't that going to get more attention on him? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's Victorian England. They're not keeping track of a bunch of things. I mean, it's not like they have documentation the way that we have documentation in the modern era. It's not like they can cross-reference a bunch of things. And so, you know, I, I, I can see the idea of, well, it worked for one, or it worked for Julia. It might as well work for Helen, too. Doyle seems to have considered this because even though that's not in the story, in the dramatic adaptation that he wrote in The Speckled Band, at the end, Watson says to Holmes, of course, supposing that Rylet did the other girl to death, it seems unlikely on the face of it that he would try it on again, as two sudden deaths in the house could hardly pass the coroner, because the same coroner would probably be there for the thing. So there would yeah. be some kind of record. Actually, it does happen at the end of that of the Speckle Band play. It happens after uh, Helen Stoner visits them, and Watson says this to Holmes. And Holmes says... No, no, Watson, you are making the mistake of putting your normal brain into Rylet's abnormal being. The exactly. born criminal, hereditary criminality here, mm -hmm. the born criminal is often a monstrous egotist. His mind is unhinged from the beginning. What he wants, he must have because he thinks a thing, it is right. Because okay. he does a thing, it will escape detection. You can't say a priori that he will take this view or that one. So Doyle actually addresses that in the play that he writes of the Speckled Band, that of course he would try yeah. the same thing because it worked once. And exactly he, that's the way his mind is and that he would try the same thing again. He wouldn't logically think that somebody might catch me if I do it again. Exactly. I mean, and and again, that's the thing is, is that it's it's basically ritual, repeating, doing the same things over and over. Um, I mean, and and that's kind of like what we we see with, I mean, if you examine modern serial killers, that's like a thing that we see is that it's basically doing the same thing um, over and over and over and over again. And so, you know, we, we could make the argument that, uh, you know, Roy Lott was in some ways a prototype for yeah. the modern serial killer. Do you know, engaging yeah. in the same behavior? Um, although I I know my friend Steve Doyle actually made the argument about um, um, <clears throat> we'll just say Baron uh, Baron Gruner from the illustrious client, which I believe is one of the stories that you were not going to be covering. Um, you know, actually being a the first of the modern uh, Sherlockian villains, like hmm. what we call modern era. But um, that particular, uh, you know, uh, book and that particular idea is actually going to be released in a BSI Press book in January um, of next year, so 2024, called "The Clutches of a Fiend," uh, looking at uh, Baron Gr uh, Baron Edelbert Gruner as a modern villain. Interesting. Yeah, uh I'm fascinated by it. Let's get to the end of the story because oh, I have yes, two things yes, I want to bring up in, in yes. as quickly as we can. Number one, um, uh, they, uh, well, number one is that, you know, Watson says at the end here, and also, uh, um, or the home says it, uh, Watson's like, oh, you drove the snake through the thing. You saw the snake come out. You, you know, lit the light and attacked it with the result of driving it through the ventilator. And home says, and also, with the result of causing it to turn upon its master at the other side. Some of the blows of my cane came home and roused its snakish temper so that it flew upon the first person it saw. In this way, I am no doubt indirectly responsible for Dr. Grimsby Roylet's death, and I cannot say that it is likely to weigh very heavily upon my conscience. Um, Holmes doesn't care that he has inadvertently killed Roylet himself. Um, yeah, I mean it's 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 he didn't kill Roylott, but he caused Roylott's death. Indirectly responsible. Indirectly responsible. And um that's not the first time that we're gonna be seeing Holmes have kind of like shades of gray when it comes to um finding the sense of justice. Justice for Holmes is not about using the legal system. 
it is about other things. You know, exactly. They change and, in different stories. Oh yes, and we'll 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 see that a lot. And I'm kind of telegraphing a little, but we'll see this uh, very much in play in the blue carbuncle. Well, um, yeah, versus... in in this one though, it is then what it means is if you're going to be a horrible enough person to kill your stepdaughters for their money, you mm -hmm. absolutely deserve to die. And I'm happy I was part of your death. Um, pretty much, yeah. Like like Holmes is unapologetic. Yeah. And that's justice. Exactly. But I mean, I I, I can kind of see it. It's like I, I, I can see why Holmes felt the way that he felt. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Holmes I mean, I'm, I'm bad, but but it's but it's not legal justice. And yeah. it's it's not moral, it's, according it's, to like this kind of, you know, Christian worldview that they're supposed to be operating in. That's not really what it's supposed to be. Yes. So. It's, it's not moral from that perspective. Yeah. But um, Holmes kind of operates outside of that moral perspective. And we're going to see that more and more as we progress yeah. through the days. He has his own, you know, moral oh, code that he needs to make sure he follows. Oh, yes. And um, like I, I wrote an essay in, um, oh, God, um, about 60, which is, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Uh, reaching up here. I wrote an essay in about 60, which is basically looking at the 60 Sherlock Holmes stories and arguing why each of these stories is the best. I wrote an essay about the Blue Carbuncle, which we will talk about in three weeks. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, about why. You're on the Blue Carbuncle story, right? You're my co-host for that, right? Oh, definitely. That's why I it's chose one of the stories you have. I, I, um, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts about the Blue Carbuncle and about the idea of justice tempered with mercy. Well, we don't have the tempered with mercy in this story, that's for sure. No mercy here. This uh, is very Cobra Kai. And now I want to remember the opening of the story in yes. which um, Helen Stoner's dead. Um, yeah. She only lived eight more years. Um, yeah. just, you know, and we're not we're not supposed to think that there was any of the She, she actually lived five story. more years. Five more? Okay. Five more. Five more years. Yeah. So um, she has... Um, uh, um died and that's why the story so it at the end of the story it's like uh, i mean if you remember that from the beginning yeah i mean it's you know she doesn't get to live happily ever after that's not the mm -hmm. kind of world we're in either that it it happens that people will just die not yeah. by a criminal's hands but just in, in life right. yeah and you know but i mean that's I, I mean, I, I, I think that's also re uh, like extraordinarily realistic of Doyle to be able to sit here and like write a story of, you know, she may not live or she may not die by the, um, you know, we'll just say kind of by the villain of the story, but she will die, you know, that she will die prematurely, that she will, you know, that there's tragedy here even if the tragedy is not caused by, you know, um, you know, we'll just say kind of the, the protagonist, if you will, of the story, it's still tragedy nonetheless. Yep. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Exactly. Um, Perfect place to end. So we've gone a real long time here. Yes. Um, and, yeah. Sorry. I <laughs> am so happy that to have you back for this episode. Um, and you will also return for episode 14, the adventure of the blue carbuncle. For I'm so excited for that one. Christmas, Christmas season awesome. mystery. Yeah. Yes. Um, coming up next week, Mary Alcaro will actually be joining me for a talk about the bloody tale of the adventure of the engineer's thumb. So Ooh, um, you know, yeah. warning, it will be gruesome. Uh, it is, happens in that story. It is so awful. It is lovely. I love it. I, I love it. It's like suddenly we're in like the Saw franchise, you know. Yes, let's dis. Let's yeah. Let let's dismember people. It's the basement funny. of a house and out in the country, and you know, and there's a trap in and the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and axe wielding maniac. That all happens exactly in the next episode. It's so um, perfect. Thanks to our chat, Mrs. Hudson, Brianna, for staying on long and managing the live chat links. Thanks to the sponsor of Sherlock Mondays, Lisa Washington. 
Uh, we couldn't do these shows without the generous support of our patrons. Yes. You can also support the Rosenbach through donation. Your support helps us create more programs like this and also care for our collections. You could also become a member. Membership gives you early access and discounts to programs and courses. You can mm -hmm. find out more at our website, rosenbach.org. Again, let me remind you all to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube to like these videos. And if you're listening to the podcast, to leave us a review. Mm -hmm. Monica, thank you so much for doing this today. Mm -hmm. Everyone, I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library, where the game is a book. Bye-bye.